Welcome back once again. Uh, we got some family in the building. We hanging backstage at our show, Council Culture. Excuse me. Hey. We hanging back here uh, <laughs> with my man, Dr. Mike Dow. Psy D, PhD, all of that good stuff. New York Times bestseller, uh, specialist in the space of ketamine. And we're yes. going to get into that yes. in one of our sessions. But man, you, I mean, this is just as much as your show as it is my show. And I, I appreciate you being a part of Council Culture from its inception, man, because I think it's so important to create safe spaces and brave places for men to be able to not only emote, but mm. also learn. Yeah. Uh, and I always say, you know, we... We feel together, we reveal together, so we can heal together. Yeah. And it, it's brothers like you, man, that give us the opportunity to ask questions that we normally don't get to ask mm. uh, because of your professional background, but then at the same space, your your care for just people. Yeah. So, man, I, I, I always say this, you know, whether you're around or with, even behind your back, man, like you're just one of the most genuine people that, you know, I've had the opportunity to work with Thank you, my in friend. such a important area. We have to, we've got to create those safe spaces, yeah, especially man. for men, because, you know, we learn that it's not okay to talk about your feelings. So whether you're straight or gay or black or Asian or white or anything in between, it's so important. Yeah, and we say this a lot on the show that you check a lot of boxes. <laughs> uh, and, but I mean, like, it's kind of cool, man, but I would love just before we get into, you know, this is being our first session yeah. here on the podcast, I would love to get into your background just a little bit. So I think that can even help with some of the questions that, you know, we have in the comments and even, you know, for myself. Um, but like, what is, is your background? Um, and like, how do you describe yourself? So, well, I'm somebody who loves people. Right. And when I was 10 years old, so just, I'm just gonna go to all the, the good parts right away. Um, my brother had this massive stroke. He has this rare brain disease. Mm. So I spent a lot of my time when I was a kid with my family in pediatric hospitals and he had wow. to go to all the, you know, brain surgeries when he was 10 years old and like, wow. he's gonna die. He didn't die, but man, it was just a lifetime. Um, and wow. I know you sort of, know a little bit about that when yeah, there's like yeah. a chronic illness and you have a kid yeah. and it just really touched my heart. I just remember being in the University of Michigan pediatric hospital and all of the things that I saw and there were so many things that I couldn't control. My brother was sharing a room with this kid who was just severely brain injured from this accident and his father was driving the car oh, and wow. I'll never forget like the wailing of that kid's dad in the room. Yeah, and so what all that gave me is just this there were so many things that I couldn't control in my family. My brother's brain was never gonna go back to the way it was before his stroke. I couldn't take away his rare brain disease, but I wanted to help people, right. you know? Yeah, and I fun. also became really obsessed with the brain's ability to heal itself with these new modalities like ketamine-assisted therapy. Right. Um, and you so- like You thought you came up with that when you were young? Yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. And then, you know, so I was doing all this volunteer work and then one day, I had this aha moment that I could do this for a living. So then I got my master's and I got my first doctorate, then my second doctorate. Talk your shit, doc. <laughs> and, <laughs> and this, I just love talking to people and I love helping people to find that inner child or that part of you that needs the help, you know? Cause yeah. we all have these masks that prevent that that wound within you from getting the help that he needs, whether it's a pediatric illness or a depression or coming out or whatever it is. Yeah, so I wanna get into your business a little bit then, yeah. your personal life. Um, are you single? I'm married. Married. Two uh, years yesterday. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. That's Thank you. Um, Thank you. Um, your ethnicity. My father was an immigrant. Uh, he passed away from South Korea. Oh, wow. My mom is this blonde Midwestern farm girl from Ohio. Wow. <laughs> so these two worlds could not have been more different. Um, I often felt like I didn't fit in anywhere, you know, just being this biracial Asian. And then imagine me leaving. My parents met in Hawaii. They had me in Hawaii. Yeah. Uh, I lived there till I was seven. My parents get divorced. I moved back with oh, my mom wow. to Ohio. And then I'm like the only brown kid in an all white suburban small town. Right. Um, and then when I think, uh, I think I was about 10 years old, I just knew I was gay too. Really? At like nine or 10. 
and I would wake up with this feeling at in the 10. morning at, at 10, year, 10 years old. And I remember showering, getting ready for school with this pit in my stomach in grade school. Like, really? I'm gay. What am I going to do with this? Really? You know? And then you do all these things. You try not to think about it, but it's there, you know? So when I hear about a kid who's suicidal or I treat a kid who's suicidal, you know, I know what that kid is going through. And if we can really help people, it doesn't matter who you are. We've all got that knot. We've all got that wound of the inner child that somebody has got to help. That's so interesting. I want to unpack that. We'll dig into that in this session because even as a father, I have... Mm. I have some some interesting questions. Um, but again, you, you check a lot of boxes. So I think you, you'll be able to give some insight to, you know, this the idea from people from different walks of life. And yeah. then there's a lot of stereotypes. There's a lot of assumptions. Yeah. A lot of things that we don't, specifically like heterosexual men, don't get a chance to even ask. Because even yeah. like us sitting here now, it's like when... Like, I love the fact that he was like, I'm gay. Because, like, now you're like, do you even, are are you even allowed to say that? Like, are you allowed to ask someone if they're gay? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like is that inappropriate? Or is it, now it's the LGBTQIA yeah. plus community. And you're like. And now oh. we took this word and now we say queer community. And, you know, 10 years ago, you would not want to say, say that, queer. right? queer, yeah. Like, and, now, you couldn't so say queer. So now it's okay. So things have changed. So, but as a heterosexual person, or even to somebody just from a different walk of life, like, when you're wanting to get to know someone, when you yeah. want to engage, like what is, like, what do you lead with? Because again, like someone who checks multiple boxes, do you, even when you tell your clients or when you're dealing in a professional environment, are you like, hey, I'm a, a, a gay psychologist? Yeah. Or, or you know, like, well, I, I think what's important is you create this opening, right? So if somebody's, you know, I think there was this very timely. Um, celebrity story where this kid was on a show, um, Heartstopper, and he was a kid, you know, he was 17 or 18. Yeah. And he was sort of forced to come out of the closet because there was all the speculation. So you don't want to say that to an adolescent. Right. But, and there's a lot of gray areas. So if you said to me, you know, these open-ended questions are really great. Like, hey, do you have, do you have a partner? And you're creating this opening. So you're not coming up to somebody and be like, oh, hey, are you gay? <laughs> you, right, know right, I mean? right. you know what I mean? But I think one of the problems is a lot of straight men and, you know, I'm different because, you know, th we now know that there are a lot of gray shades in between black or white. Now right. I'm one of those people, my sexual orientation, I'm what they call a gold star gay. <laughs> no, wait, wait. <laughs> Never had sex with a woman. <laughs> I could not have sex with a woman, even if I gold wanted to, you know what I mean? Now. So I'm on this end of the spectrum. Now we also know today, and when you look at how many people are identifying as something in between, but I think one of the main problems is we confuse this, you know, on a scale of one to 10 or A to Z, right? Because there's no right or wrong. There's your sexual orientation. There's okay. your gender, you know, your yeah, sex. Those are two completely different things. But then there's this other measure of masculinity versus femininity, mm. right? So can I ask you on a scale of one to 10 with one being totally masculine and 10 being totally feminine. Like, where do you say that you lie on that spectrum? And we're talking specifically energy, right? Yeah, energy. Because I feel like I'm very in touch with my feminine. Yeah. You know, we talked about this on many occasions where it's like, that's, that's, a, that's your nurturing yeah. aspect of your energy. That's your empathetic side. So I, I'm, because I'm a Libra, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm, I would say I'm balanced. Yeah, I would say so too. You know what I mean? Like, I'm very, like, I have no problem emoting. I have no problem connecting. I actually, you know, everything from, like, I, I have a flamboyant nature to who I am. Like, I, I like to dress. I like to get fly. Like, and I feel yeah. like all of those type of things live in, the, in your feminine. Yeah. Uh, but I also love my masculine. I love being a provider. I love you know, being assertive. I love being, you know, strong. And, yeah. and, you know, when I need to be, you know, resilient. And and it is about that equanimity. It is about that balance. Um, but everybody doesn't understand that because in that question, the average person, when you hear somebody say, you know, uh, where do you lie, one to 10, yeah. masculine yeah. or feminine, a heterosexual man believes that his answer is supposed to be, I'm all... Correct. I'm all masculine. Correct, correct. Yeah. 
And, and they, they don't understand we're talking about energy and that how those feminine tendencies are right. in different And places. they confuse sexual orientation with, you know, yeah. at that given moment, like for you, you're in touch with your masculine side, you're in yeah, touch with your I, feminine I'm, side. And it's going to change from exactly. moment to moment. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, totally. I, I remember being really, it's almost like straight people sometimes give this to you as a compliment, like, oh man, like. I never guessed you were gay, you know what I mean? Because they're <laughs> You're not like the other gays. Because they're confusing <laughs> sexual orientation with right. masculinity versus femininity, and they're totally different. Just like gender is very different yeah. from your sexual orientation, which is very different uh, we from We want to break your, all of that down. You know what too. I mean? Yeah. And if you could really just create this open space, because, you know, as somebody who's in his 40s, yeah. you know, I'm looking at 20 year old queer kids and you know there's there's so many more shades of gray even from when I came out to now and even the words have changed the yeah. words the terms they change every 10 years so you don't have to know if you're trying to get to know somebody you don't have to know the lingo you don't have to know everything and if you can come but in if that you don't want to offend like cause I'm gonna tell you I'm gonna keep it stack uh, yeah. I'm a gold star non-gay. You know what I mean? I've I'm, I'm, I'm never done anything, never had any thoughts about a man. Yeah. I don't, I mean, but I look, to each his own. Like you right. said, like You're even this generation. exclusively heterosexual. I love being heterosexual. Yeah. I love women. I love, like, I just, there's nothing to me that, and it's so, because I don't, I never want to be, like, I don't want to be offensive in that sense, mm -hmm. but it's like, and they, we always thought, like, I never could even fathom mm. being attracted to a man. But I was like, that's because I'm not gay. Right, like, I right, get, like right. it's, that's not. But if that's what someone else. Because that's even because I found this to be difficult to talk about as well, because yeah, like yeah. I used to say, well, if that's what you like. Yeah. And then because of the the difference between orientation and gender, people are like, well, that's not necessarily what I like. That's who I am. Right. So now I have to right. be like, well, that's who you are. Right. So it's like, even in that scenario, because it used to be defined as a sexual preference. Right. So the conversation was a little easier. Right, right. Before, but now when you're like, well, you know, since I feel like the, I was born this way mm. conversation came, it's, it makes heterosexual people a little, it, it just makes them have to walk or, or, or tiptoe around or the conversation because yeah. you never want to offend someone's nature. Yeah. And because we, you know, we're all human, we're all in this together. So it's like, all right, well, it used to be like, I was, I used to always say, shoot, what, what you do in the dark is your business. You know mm. what I mean? But then now that it's become more than like, because people want to be out and accepted and everything, you know, as, of course, like, rights yeah and, you know people yeah. literally are dying and fighting to yeah. to be equal so obviously you want to support that but it's very as someone who wants to have compassion who wants to be considerate mm. it's a little difficult for heterosexual men to navigate through the lgbtqia community i think sometimes and just sure. dealing with like i just want to be a good guy I yeah, don't, you know, yeah i don't want to offend anyone i want to you know and sometimes they just don't understand it right i yeah. think some human beings or all human beings we we really tend to surround ourselves with people who are mostly like us you yeah. know right um and if you don't know something sometimes you just don't know what to do so sometimes you just just in that situation where then you just don't say anything at all but well, there's a lot of ignorance out there so what's offensive to you when you know, someone who, you know, is from a different walk of life, when you hear certain things or when you see something online or or even I'm pretty sure your comment section is gets crazy sometimes. With a it, lot can, of people. it can, it like, can, you know. I, what, I, what bothers you or what were you like, yo, we got to do away with this, specifically coming from men? When people don't have good intentions, you know, somebody can say something. You know, I always tell people when I when I met you, I never experienced when I met you face to face. You thought I was an asshole. <laughs> but, Before you met me, you thought I was an asshole. Well, Tell everybody. Yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't like you based on what I read. And right. then, you know, your energy as this exclusively heterosexual guy who has these kids and has these beautiful wives and has had, you know, this beautiful wife or, and all these women that he's, you know, I just didn't I like understand women, it. Right? <laughs> so we're so different, right? And yeah. I, I have to admit that I came in with this image of you and then I had to get to know you, right? right. 
And I think if people have good intentions and if they are on my comment sections, if they have good intentions and they want to get to know me, I can feel it's not even what you say, it's how you say it. Mm. Like everything you've ever asked me has been in a super respectful way. You know, I'm not a 17 year old. So right. if you want to say like, hey, do you have a, do you have a partner? Do you, you know, and I yeah. want to offer up that information like, yeah, my husband's name is Chris, right? Yeah. Like that's okay because yeah. I know that you're coming from this good place. Right. And I think if we realize that we all have so much in common and we have way more things as human beings that bring us together than set us apart. I mean, yeah. man, the world would be a better place yeah, if we could find those things. We have so many more similarities than we do differences. We do. Um, so how do you deal with the haters? Or especially coming up from someone who knew that they were gay since they were 10. Like the adversity, man, like what, what have you, what are the tools What's the armor that you put on uh, to combat all of the negativity? When you hear the word faggot all the time, when you're called that, when you've heard it in your family, right? Wow. Like jokes in your family. I just remember sitting, um, somebody in my family, I just remember hearing like this faggot joke. And I think I must have been 12. And what that does to a 12 year old, I just remember the pit in my stomach mm -hmm. when you just feel like, oh, does my family not like who I am? Are they not gonna wow. accept me or love me? So my armor is this. Now, as somebody who's done a lot of work on himself and I'm com I've come a long way, and you know, you would have asked me at 12, would you flip a switch and be straight? I would have said yes, absolutely. Today, absolutely not. I really? would never flip that switch today, really? but I would have at 12 because right. I didn't understand. I just didn't have a place. When I see those haters, I understand that it's coming from a place of ignorance, right? right? Like they don't know, they don't understand. Right. And I think if we could just understand each other a little bit more, you know, if, if somebody's coming up and they're growing up in this super small town and everybody around them is this uber conservative and they don't even know any, they, or they don't know that they know, know any queer people. <laughs> right, they probably right. do, but they don't hey, know that they do. They went to church, they know. Maybe we <laughs> need to have a little grace for them and understanding just yeah. because they're not gonna understand these things yet. So, I mean, I, man, I would love to dig uh, into that as well to where, cause even at 12 and knowing that and, and having to, hide yourself and knowing that that weight of feeling disliked yeah. and you haven't even really come into your own yeah i, I have so many questions because he, I, and i want to ask from uh the perspective of of a father mm. um we hear this have you ever heard that they they there's a question and, and people have gotten in trouble by saying it incorrectly mm -hmm. but they ask you know heterosexual men what would you do if your son was gay mm. or how would you handle it if your son was gay and there's a spectrum of answers mm. and you know if you would ask me you know before I started doing work on myself and mm. even just the time that it was 20 years ago yeah I would have been like, man, my, I never, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, you know, like yeah. all of the things yeah, yeah. that probably now appear to be homophobic. Mm. But now as a father, because mm. I am actually a father, yeah. and like I just want my children to be happy, healthy, yeah. and safe. Yeah. You know what I mean? Those are the three things. Um, so I wouldn't care. You know right. what I mean? Like I really wouldn't. Um, but also as a father of just like multiple children who have just... And they're also different, right? So different. Yeah. Like, I really wouldn't care because it's like at this point, it's like, all right, that's that's your. Some people have this in their life. Some people have that in their life, you yeah. know. And yeah. and I get the benefit and the blessing of actually being able to witness that, yeah. you know, daily. But so now when I hear that question, it's it's almost like a trivial question, right? Right. Right. You know what I mean? Because that's the last thing you're thinking about. But even like all the time, I joke. You know, I just not joking to be honest. Like when, <laughs> when they ask about my daughter, yeah, they'll yeah. be like, "I want my daughters to be lesbians," <laughs> and it sounds funny, 
But, you know, just in the world that we live in, yeah. you know. Because you want to protect them, right? I'm thinking about protection. You're thinking I'm about thinking those about straight men who are going to be those stereotypically. If somebody yeah. puts, some man puts their hands on But look woman. at how you opened up, you know yeah. what I mean? So I think the armor that I wear, if I would have been with Nick when he was 22 years old, if you would have said something that would have been characterized as homophobic, yeah. you didn't know yet because you didn't have the life experience. So I'm One, give, I wasn't a father. Right. But there are scenarios and we, you know, we've read stories, seen movies about it to where when someone does come out mm. to, you know, their their father, their father disowns them. Their yes. father never speaks to them again. That's right. Still uh, in this day and age, they still do that. And I would say, and this is this is probably the, the deeper question I would mm. like to ask. As a heterosexual father, I want my son to be like me. Mm. I'm not homosexual. Mm -hmm. So is it homophobic to say, I want my son to be heterosexual. I think there is a part of you that all of us want our kids, kids to be like us. So I don't experience that as homophobic or wrong because I also know that there is another part of you, a higher part of you that I've heard speak tonight yeah. that primarily wants your kids to be happy. Right. Right. And if their self-actualization and becoming who they truly are is going to override that part of your ego that does want your kid to be just like you. A lot of parents say that that's not a wrong thing. But I also have a feeling that if your kid was gay, that that higher self that you have would be OK with it, even though there's another part of you that would want your kids to be just like you. Right. A straight man. Right. So maybe that's OK that we have one part of us that wants this. But when push comes to shove, this higher part would probably override the part of the ego that wants our kids to be like That's a great this. answer. So you got to rise to your higher self. So I hate labels. Mm. And just as much as I hate labeling this person, or as I always say, um, to define me is to confine me. Mm. Um, labeling is, at some time can just... just stifle so many things because like you're this you're yeah. that labeling especially now labels and certain words mm. are discrediting yes. people so just as much as you know no one wants to be called the f word or all these terms or even now because there is the lgbtqia plus yeah um when one is called homophobic mm. I don't like that term mm. because that's a discrediting term. Mm. Because soon as you, someone places homophobic on someone, it's like oh, you get canceled. Totally, yeah. It yeah, can yeah. ruin your career. Yeah. It can ruin your social yep. environment. Yep. Because one thing about the LGBTQIA, they rally together and they are a powerful community. Yeah. And as soon as someone gets labeled homophobic, yeah. now they're exiled, now they're ignorant, now they're all of these things yeah. where someone could have just made an honest mistake. Yeah. Because uh, ignorance happens, yeah. but there might not be any malice in it. They might not like, and obviously that's why we have council culture, but is there anything one can do? Because I have friends mm. um, that have lost jobs, mm. uh, that have had to spend lots of time in HR, mm -hmm. you know, uh, because they're like, I shouldn't have to accept mm. a lifestyle of someone else. I shouldn't have to use the pronoun someone wants to use. I shouldn't have to be able to say all of the, you know, initials in LGBTQIA. I shouldn't, I should be able to say the F word if I want to, because just as much as you are who you are and comfortable with being yourself. I'm who I am and I'm comfortable with being myself. So if I'm over here and you're over there, like they, they honestly believe that yeah. and have lost their jobs because of it, have lost other friends and family members because they're so stern and be like, call me what you want, but you know, I'll be homophobic if, you, if that's what it is. And you know, things get really, because of that label, you know, that I've seen so many things get broken up because of that. I wonder if we could just have an openness with that person who does have those beliefs and just get to know them, you know. In therapy, when I'm with patients, when I get to know people for who they are and where all of their beliefs came from, their, right. 
their traits, their beliefs, you know, where did you learn that? You know, sometimes there's a little bit of an opening and a correlation, you know, the brain is such an interesting organ because it will make these associations yeah. that will confuse things. Just like it's gonna confuse, well, gay and femininity, those go hand in hand. Well, they, they actually don't. A lot of times they may, but not always, right? Right. So I, I think there's, there's something, if we can just go to the root in the brain of, well, where did you learn that? And what part of you doesn't like that part of them? See, I think that's dealing with the individual. I think in, you know, through therapies, like you can act, yep. absolutely fix that. Yeah. They're actually open someone up. Yeah. But I'm talking more societal in this specific term of, oh, you're homophobic. Mm. Or, and it's like, I feel like that term is just as offensive as any other term because it's a term that discredits. Mm. And where, and men for the people who probably actually are homophobic, because mm -hmm. we know there there's gay bashing. Mm -hmm. There's people that come from communities that literally have a disdain, a hate, and a fear mm -hmm. of homosexuality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's the same thing as someone being ignorant to yep. a, a identity or a lifestyle. Yeah. So how do we get rid of canceling people or labeling them as homophobic to where we can get to a place to have a conversation like this. I, I do think that there is, you know, we were talking about what that person could do in therapy, right? And there's sort of this black or white nature between what you would do in therapy and then the public facing HR, like I've gotta be this totally- The apology tour. The apology tour. I believe that if we could have a little bit of gray area between these two poles. Right. Maybe we could have a little you bit more understanding. Funny, right? These right? two poles. <laughs> <laughs> no pun intended. I want to let that slide. But but it's 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 <laughs> <laughs> But we could have those type of jokes. But, but we we could have more understanding for yeah. you know that person who does say something that is just coming from ignorant who doesn't want to go out and bash my head because I'm gay right. and the person who does, right? So maybe we could create a little bit more understanding because what happens when we try to cancel people? We all have that part of our ego that goes, oh, you're gonna tell me what to do? Oh, that I'm just gonna either defend myself or I'm afraid I'm gonna lose my job, so I'm gonna get stronger, I've gotta double down on it. Yeah. And if we're gonna come together, we've gotta figure out how to peel that piece back. Right. And you're right, some of that very rigid, like you're either this or that, it prevents any of that gray area from coming forth. So, one reason, we're, we're friends and I love you, and one thing I know is like, you have a great sense of humor. Um, you take a joke, we can laugh, I can make yeah, jokes yeah. about two poles and <laughs> all that stuff, like, and it's funny. Yeah. But, a lot of times, and I'll, I'll say it, yeah. you know, the LGBTQIA community yeah. uh, has known to be a lot more sensitive mm. as times have gone on. Yeah. Um, if Dave Chappelle was sitting right here mm. on your couch and he came to you to, to talk about all the things that we know, he's, he's definitely uh, has his... Uh, uh, discourse and challenges and battles with the mm. transgender community. Yeah. What would you say to Dave Chappelle? I would say that he'd had, what I would say to Dave Chappelle is unlike you, he hasn't earned the right. He doesn't have the context to say those things. You know, when you say something to me, it's funny because, you know, I think you and I have high levels of emotional intelligence and I can sense that you're always coming from a good place with me. Right. right, And we have a rapport that allows us to sort of say things to each other where there's, we can go deep, we know that we're not offending each other, and right. there's, there's more bandwidth, you know? And I think if you know somebody has good intentions, I think you get more of that bandwidth. I think sometimes when you're a comedian like, like him, and you don't have that, that understanding, I would just say that a lot of his jokes, you know, frankly, I think they're kind of lazy, you know? Like what? That's we, offensive to a comic. <laughs> well, because in, in that in that area, because I, That's I think pretty much calling him a hack, Doc. I think <laughs> when he's not in that lane, yeah. you know, I do wonder what I want to say to him is when you are so funny in other in other areas, yeah. isn't it kind of lazy just to go to the thing that people are are raising you for? Yeah, I, see, I, like, I, gotta, I actually don't know his comedy yeah, that well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so but I was saying, I'd have to defend my my man. I'm always going to defend all comics because I do one. I believe in freedom of speech, but I also believe in this space of 
There's nothing off limits when it comes to comedy. Because in comedy, we make black jokes, we make poor jokes, we make short jokes, we make fat jokes. And then all of a sudden it started coming up like, oh, you can't make jokes about the LGBTQIA community. And like what I, the way I got around it and the way yeah. I fixed it is like, I love the LGBTQIA community. Like I want everyone to be you everybody gonna get these jokes. Caitlyn Jenner gonna get these jokes. Like yeah. and nothing. So when I created Wild and Out, I not only we, we got transgender comedians, we got yeah. transgender rappers, we got and everybody gets an opportunity to have a voice. And it's all in jest. And at the end of the day, we're all friends and we hug it out at the end of the day. But I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about you know that this and that and you gonna talk about my color and my like in it all because we're we know we're joking so in that sense in defense of a comedian if yeah. his job is to joke if a comedian's job is to hold a mirror up to society and talk about how absurd all of society yeah. is why does one community get the opportunity to say uh uh-uh, uh you can't say that about us i don't think it's just the queer community i think it's all those groups you just mentioned and i want to go back to this that's just lazy and it, it's lazy slash the way you tell a joke and the intention behind it i was at the comedy store and this comedian was very lazy and there was one person in the front row wearing a mask and his joke was this guy like he didn't know where to go he's like <laughs> this guy why are you wearing a mask? I'm like, that's a lazy joke. And the guy goes, I've got an autoimmune disease. He's like, this guy. I'm like, well, that's a lazy comedian. Like, that's where yeah, you're going to go. Like he was horrible. So, I gotta you get know, you some better comedy I clubs. think it's the context. So I agree that we've got to have a little bit of a sense of humor, no matter which, right? The Asian guy, the gay guy, the black, you know, whoever you are. And someone but the like, context is different. But someone like Dave Chappelle, he has made it his job to challenge every form of thought, mm. every lifestyle, every identity. And he and he didn't, like I think because you know, now it's been heightened and magnified at such a, a level because it's literally war. And he's, he's gone to bed, like he's literally risked his entire career multiple times standing on the ability to say whatever he wants to say. And in the, world of comedy we look at that as like that's brave mm. we look at that as like that's wow like that that guy got balls literally like he got like he says things that most people would never say and that's his style of comedy like and there's there's multiple comics who have done that i mean one of the greatest comedians to me ever is george carlin some of the things that he said would but it was it was brilliant but it was like yo only he had the gall to say that. And the same thing with, you know, Richard Pryor, who even, you know, Richard Pryor lived an alternative lifestyle, mm. grew up in, you know, a, a brothel. And, mm. you know, like, and he talks about it in his book and even in some of his stand-up, like, he, he was, lived a fluid lifestyle at one mm. point in time, but still, he was so unapologetic about everything that he said that we respected him in his art form for that. So as someone who knows Dave Chappelle, mm. I would say, I don't believe there's any malice in there. I don't think there's, and like, again, and it's, and, and like you said, you're probably not familiar with it, but I think where I got, I got lost is like, he actually talked about a close friend that he met in a comedy club who was transgendered, who mm -hmm. wanted to be a comedian, who he befriended, that they, he, he thought Dave was the funniest man in the world, and they went on the road together, and he started championing. Yeah. Dave Chappelle to the community yeah, and yeah. that that individual got bullied so much mm. uh, that she committed suicide mm. in that in that way that I feel like that uh, from hearing Dave tell the story mm -hmm. that is what angered him and fueled him so much to say I have to deal with this whether it's his own mm. stuff that he's dealing with or the fact that it's like, if society was a little bit more lenient, mm. if society wasn't so stringent upon yep. labels and who we are and what we are, and people just uh, were allowed to be human beings, and if you make the mistake of calling a she a he or a they a them or what, whatever it is, you're not bombarded and, and berated with you're homophobic or you're this or you're that, yeah. or you're not, you're not coming out to a show where people are going to be yelling at you and telling you that 
you know, you're canceled and all that stuff. It's like, that's ultimately the job of a comedian is to bring levity. I, I think the levity is important. And I think we do need to have a, you know, a sense of humor. I, I think, you know, and again, I haven't seen his show, yeah, yeah. but you know, but you know the, the, little, overall but yeah, the little idea. clips that I've read yeah, in the yeah. news, you know, I, I think what he needs to do a better job of is communicating that he has good intentions because I don't think that that's communicated to the gay community, to the queer community. And, you know, I yeah. think when you I mean, say I think it, it, I think it's not as loud. Yeah. Because the things that do get put out, because again, he tell, if you go back and watch, I forgot which special it was, he dedicated his whole show to his friend. And, and uh, their relationship and how he was heartbroken when he lost his mm. friend. I also think there should be a congruence between, you know, there are communities out there who do need a little bit more grace or sensitivity because they do have it harder. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I think totally. if if that community, you know, and we look at the suicide rates of, of gay, transgender, transgender young people especially man those right. suicide rates are so high and you realize that these kids these young people or these adults they need sensitivity so maybe there needs to be a little bit more congruence between okay this wow. is a community who needs a little bit more sensitivity and you know the the matching it with the intention and communicating the good intention because i have to tell you i have laughed at asian jokes and gay jokes at comedy stores but I had a sense there was something in my EQ, my emotional intelligence, that I knew that there was that no that hate. Was no hate. Right. And sometimes when I just read those quotes from Chappelle, I just think, and you know, clearly the the commentary around it, it's like, if he doesn't have malintent, he is not communicating that to people. And I think if he did, the runway or the grace would 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 start to increase. You hit with a, a powerful word. I think we used it before. It was like sensitivity. Mm. Now. As much as Dave needs sensitivity, could the community offer up some sensitivity to him? I think so. Because I, well, if in yeah. that in that sense, because I think initially mm -hmm. Dave probably had no malice and mm -hmm. probably was just making a joke. And because I know him, he was just like, I joke yeah. about everybody. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But then when he started to literally get bombarded, when his when his family started to get threatened, when he started to oh, get hate right? mail, Oof. when people started Oof. saying they hate him, yeah. they want to do away with him, yeah. a, a natural reaction is, I yeah. hate you too. Right. Or as much hurt and pain as you're bringing me, I want to inflict that onto you. And he's wise enough to know that it's not the entire community, but I think he's talking to the individuals that he knows has expressed that disdain and hate for right. him. To your point, you know, can all of us in the community that I'm a part of, can we be more sensitive? You know, I think what's happening is it's like ego meets ego. And as soon as you got ego one-upping each other, then there's no grace. It's like, nope, I'm not even going to give you like a, a centimeter here. I'm right. not even going to give you that much. You know yeah. what I mean? And I think if all of us, man, you look at all the conflicts around the world, it's like ego versus ego. And when one, one ups the other, it's like there's no space. And you feel it in people's tone, in their body language. So you're right. I think that, you know, there could be opportunities for people to come together, you know? Shall we pause there? I believe... That's a great place to end this session because, I mean, we found resolution. I mean, if, yeah. if we remove the ego, yeah. which we hear a lot in, in therapy, yeah. but just as much as you want people to be sensitive to your desires, needs, wants, and feelings, mm. we got to offer that up. Yeah. So in a scenario, you know, if this was Dave sitting here, I think he would probably receive that. Mm. You know, uh, there's nothing wrong with being a little bit more sensitive at yeah. times. Not being radical. a lot a, a more thoughtful, you know. You can still be joke, but like you said, you you can sense someone's energy, and if we're combating, then there's then it's it's hard to see the love. It's radical what you just said, but don't we need radical love and acceptance if we're going to heal life's hardest problems? I think we do. There it is. I know the comments are going to go up on this one, uh, but my man Mike Dow literally is my friend and my partner in council culture. So you'll see lots of him. So uh, again, get ready, for the, get ready for the comments. They're coming. <laughs> and I'll see you on the next session. See you then. Yeah.